Okay, welcome every, everyone to today's lecture on large language models and artificial intelligence. And today we have another guest that perfectly fits the theme of this mm -hmm. lecture series, uh, Professor Barbara Planck. Um, Barbara is a full professor of artificial intelligence and computational linguistics at the uh, University of Munich, the Ludwig Maximilians Universität, and she is the lead of the My NLP Lab, the Munich AI and NLP Lab Research Lab, and the co-director of the Center for Information and Language Processing in Munich. She's also a professor at the Computer Science Department of the IT University of Copenhagen. Um, her research is supported by the Independent Research Fund Denmark, the European Research Council, and the Munich Center for Machine Learning. And she was recently elected to be the vice president-elect of the Association for Computational Linguistics. Congratulations again. Thank you so much. And um, today she will be giving a talk about a very interesting topic in natural language processing, namely uncertainty, revisiting trustworthiness in NLP, two views on uncertainty. And um, she will discuss trustworthiness and reliable, re reliability in natural language processing systems. And the second view, human variability in text production and labeling. That's um, welcome, Barbara, and looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much, uh, Ben Roth. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. I'm really honored to be here uh, at uh, giving this talk. Uh, I saw that you had an amazing program so far, so I hope I can you find some of this which I'm talking today about uh, somehow also connected to the others and yet new, so that it gives you a new angle on on what you heard about in this specific about language processing. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll deep in, delve into two views, but you will see throughout the talk that they are quite interconnected. And that's the human side and the modeling side. And uh, let me start off with um, first showing you, I hope, can we actually lower the light? At the, is it possible? I'm sorry, I forgot to lower just the lights here. Um, I will show you the, a picture about the traditional NLP pipeline. So what we are doing in NLP or in general in machine learning, so essentially we need data, right? Yes, perfect, thanks so much. We need data which we feed into the models we are building and then we need to also have a way to evaluate how good they are, right? This is key to NLP, this is key to vision, this is key to anything doing with machine learning. And as, you, as I try to depict here, a lot of the effort typically goes into the modeling, right? How do we build these models to solve the task at hand? But throughout this talk, I try to hopefully convince you a little bit that, you know, data and evaluation are the things that perhaps have taken a little bit a secondary role, although they feel this, this, this uh, endeavor, right? We really need data and evaluation, but I hopefully uh, convince you that we need to that these two will become even more important also in the light of that we the modeling is becoming more and more homogeneous we are using very similar models uh, nowadays if we compare them back to when i started as a phd student it was very a wide range of possibilities and now it's all about transformer based models for instance um, but uh, while this is the nlp pipeline as we know it i would like to bring another aspect in because the, the way uh, or what feeds into this pipeline is not just data modeling and evaluation, but who is actually doing the, this, right? The designer of the um, um, NLP pipeline, for instance, but also the people who label the data or the people who we ask to evaluate our data, right? So this human aspect plays a central role in NLP or anything based on machine learning. And that's another thing that I believe is becoming more and more important to build into our, our technology. So with this in mind, um, uh, I want to just uh, briefly give us a few ideas. So we are still at a time where there's a lot of challenges out there for 
making NLP more broadly available uh, for everyone and to make it what, what we can also call more trustworthy. And with more trustworthy, um, an important aspect is also to make it more human facing, right? To include the human uh, aspects in modeling. So here's just a slide on two of possible aspects which are important or which, um, you know, on the one side, we want to make it more inclusive because there's still a lot of uh, work done on, on big languages like English, uh, standard languages, right? And there's a lot to be done to learn from language variants which are not so well supported so far. And similarly to learn also from very limited data. So all of this goes into the direction, hey, what can we do to make NLP more inclusive? This is not what I'm gonna talk today about. So we're doing a lot of work also in this first bubble to do um, support uh, NLP for low resource languages, for instance. But I will talk about today on the second part, which I phrased under this um, thing to, to make NLP technology more human facing. And this is what I'm also trying to get into this trustworthiness angle. So how can we make it in future more reliable so that it is more aligned with human perspectives, for instance, or we'll see more aspects of this. And with this here, I will delve into two aspects. One is uh, the human side of things, and the second is the model side of things. And um, I will, sh will try to connect these two in order to see how there is variation in both human perception and uh, variation in generation, but how does this also relate to models and how, how robust are these models uh, as such. Okay, are you all with me? Great, then in the next part of the talk, I will first move into this uh, first perspective on human uh, label variation. I will also explain what I mean because this might be not so clear at this stage and then w w move into how can we create more trustworthy models, showing you a couple of research examples. And in the end, I will try to come back and put this all under one big umbrella to discuss uh, what does trustworthiness mean in terms of uh, the era of large language models, okay? That's the goal of the talk. So let's first go into human liberation and then into trustworthy modeling, showing you three examples, three case studies, and then finally wrap up with uh, trustworthiness in the era of large language models. All right, now, if you think of language, right? That's the central object of study in computational linguistics or natural language processing. It's a really fascinating object because we are studying something that changes, studying something that's ambiguous, studying something that is, yeah, dynamic, right? Changing, it's, it's very multifaceted, can come in different forms. Um, so here is a little depiction of possible dimensions of variation. This is by no means exhaustive, but it's just to illustrate that, you know, language can be ambiguous, but there is also, it can be vague, um, it can be uh, subjective, or you name it. So, you know, social dimensions matter, the way to whom you talk matters, uh, the way who you are matters. There's so much variation that plays into how we on the one side uh, express ourselves, but on the other side also how we make ourselves understandable. And NLP today is, is actually quite, um, I would say, in this mostly rather narrow in the, able, in the ability to, to deal with this variation. And so how, what can we do to embrace more of this variation? That's one of the key questions. Um, so um, in general, um, we can think of variation as something that's also typically considered something that we don't want, okay? Because it's very hard to deal with all of this phenomena. Um, but we also know that it's everywhere, right? So variation is, is ubiquitous. And now a prototypical example with what I will start with is if you think at labeling, you know, doing an annotation task where you ask your labelers, the humans, to give you what is the sentiment or what is the, what is the, um, what is the label for a certain, uh, what is the interpretation of this question, for instance? Is it, is it um, you know, um, then you, you see a lot of variation in, in this process of humans not um, giving you different answers to a question, right? And um, um, this is something that has been observed a lot. So when we do um, ask people to judge something, 
we often see disagreement between these uh, um, you know, examples. So there's a lot of this. If, if you think now, at I'll give you a couple of examples to make this more concrete. Um, if we try to build a system for toxic language detection, right? The, the notion of what's toxic is very different for different people annotating the data. And in fact, there has been now a lot of research into, hey, um, there is a lot of variation or disagreement in this, in this data. Um, but it, it's also important to think about, do you want to model this variation or do you want to have a, a ground truth, a single label that's correct? So in this space, it's, it's very kind of obvious that not all text is equally tox toxic for everyone and how to deal with this problem. Um, but this is uh, an example where it's quite subjective, where there is a lot of other tasks where it's not so obvious that there are many possibilities. And here is another example that's um, understanding indirect answers to polar questions. So if I ask you a polar a yes, no question, like, hey, everything okay? And you get, I'm just mad at my agent. And you understand probably very well what this means, right? But it's very difficult for the machine to interpret this. Is this now a yes, a no, a yes subject to some condition? Is it neither yes or no, right? So even there you can see if you ask now humans, what does it mean? There might be some disagreement, but even for very simple cases, um, there it's very difficult. So, and this goes on. So while we have a lot of NLP tasks, which work just in text, we also have uh, language and vision tasks. For instance, visual question answering, where we have an image and we have a question. And here is this girl here standing. And the question is, what is the pattern in the little girl's dress? Or where is this? And you see that when people are asked to give an answer to this question, you get very different answers, right? Like, where is this? It's on the road, it's outside outdoors and so on. Um, but what we then observe or what we then actually use is essentially we ignore this variation. We, j we take just the most frequent answer in order to train these systems. So we're losing a lot of nuances in the data. Okay, uh, why that? Because typically um, while this agreement exists and is everywhere, we in our field, uh, we really like to do what we call aggregation or deriving a gold standard. So even if we have, say, documents labeled by multiple annotators, we then in the end, um, uh, play, or not play, sorry, <laughs> we work with just a single label that we call the so-called gold label, the ground truth for this document. And we typically ignore that there is variation by uh, multiple annotators, so multiple people that have labeled the data. Um, so, uh, is this then a, a, a truth, right? That's the question. We are doing, we're working with this, with this uh, variation here, with this gold label. So is it then really a truth what we are modeling or what are we actually modeling? And this is something, um, that's why the term now, finally, human label variation is a term that I introduced to encompass all this plausible variation that, we, that exists out there, that has been observed in data, but it will become important uh, later on also. And I try to put this together because if we see that two people or two annotators give us different labels, so here an example of entailment and neutral for a task which we'll, I will come back to later, um, different, uh, different studies or different fields have called this very differently. So like annotator disagreement um, or perspectives or multiple plausible answer and I try to to uh, unify all this notion into this human label variation um, distribution or notion. And why that? Because maybe it's not just disagreement that we observe, right? It's not always clearly the case that two labels cannot hold at the same time. It's more nuanced than, than that. And that's why uh, this variation uh, in general. At the same time, I want to highlight that um, while we have variation, human level variation, we still have also errors, right? If you look at data, and you're lucky to get data from multiple annotators. There are sometimes cases where it's a clear error in the annotation, right? Where people would say, hey, this is actually not plausible variation. And so this is an important thing, and I will come back to this again later, because um, where is this, this line between what's genuine variation 
and what's really an error, because if we have too many errors in our data, that means we do bad mo modeling, right? That impacts our machine learning and impacts our evaluation. So this is bad, this is kind of good, and we want to keep it. That's my message here. Okay. Let me uh, just give you an example. Um, lateral language inference is one of the examples where this variation has been studied quite a bit. And there is this nice um, study by Eli Pavlik and Tom Kwiatowski from 2019. Um, so the, the task is you have a sentence and a second sentence, and you need to say whether uh, the second sentence entails or contradicts the first one, or if there is a neutral relationship between the two. Uh, so it's a three-way um, labeling task, and they had a data set with uh, almost 500 sentence pairs. So here on the x-axis you see the, on the y-axis you see the sentence pairs. And they tried to then from this, uh, for each of these pairs they had five annotators, estimate a Gaussian mixture model to estimate whether there is more than one component that explains the label. And what they found is that they, they had quite a substantial amount of, um, sim uh, from these, um, you know, uh, um, instances where there was a non-controversial uh, 20%, non-trivial second component that can exp help to explain this variation that they observed. So this means that um, there's not just one, oh, I should say, they actually did it uh, in a continuous fashion. So they didn't ask for the three labels, but they asked for a rating scale. And then they estimated this Gaussian mixture model. So they got not just a, a unimodal distribution, but they got more than a unimodal. They got a bimodal distribution, which explained the data, which shows that um, this uh, ground truth is not unimodal type in this case. Okay. All right. Uh, why do I talk about human label variation? Um, going back to the picture in the beginning, right? If you think now about this variation, right? It impacts all three steps. And traditionally, getting multiple annotations of judgments was done only at the data acquisition stage when you create resources. Why? Because you want to, it was taken or is taken to get a judgment of how good the data process, the co collection process is. So, so just done on a small sample, typically. And once this is good enough, then you go on and the individual annotators annotate. So the problem is you, you not often have data with multiple annotations. And then the multiple annotations are essentially disregarded and you do your machine learning on the one ground truth. And while this has fueled um, NLP for a long time, also computer vision for a long time, um, there is, we are missing out on something. And that's, that's kind of the key. Uh, it impacts the modeling, but it also impacts evaluation, right? Again, in evaluation, we have done one ground rule that we keep. And, um, and why is this important? Well, you know, it also connects to uncertainty, right? It's essentially also an expression of uncertainty in the label if people don't agree on a certain label, right? So this is kind of the human side of uncertainty that I would like you to take away from today. All right, um, now what can we do? Um, I just now briefly, um, if you assume that you have this variation and um, you, know, you, you have some, uh, what, what can you do with it? Then essentially, if you look at the literature, there are, are two broad directions to deal with human liberation. Uh, one is advocating for resolving it, wanting just one ground truth, essentially. And so you can essentially aggregate it, as we saw, and derive a gold standard. Or you can also use it to filter out data. You say, people don't agree on, I, don't, I think it's a noisy instance, I disregard it. That's another approach. But there is also an increasing amount of work that says, hey, let's leverage this variation. And what can you do? Two, two directions. You can Think of learning from the raw data, from the multiple annotations, from the unintegrated labels, or you still have a gold and you enrich it with the multiple annotations that you have. So there's different directions here as well. Okay, but it's just to give you an idea, okay, people have explored these ideas in trying to improve their modeling. And um, uh, I want to show you, I want to go somewhere else and I'm not going into these methods because I will you know, try to 
motivated also from another angle, and that's the data set cartography angle. Um, there was, this is a paper from ACL 2020, and um, how many of you have seen this before? Just hands up. Two, three, 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 yes. <laughs> okay, um, I, I, I will briefly explain it um, because I will use it also in later parts of the talk and also in the next slide on uh, motivating, um, looking at variation in data. So what does this do? Dataset cartography is uh, essentially a method, a tool that you can use when training your neural network and after training you that derive a map of your data. And what do you see here? You essentially during training, um, um, after each epoch, you're looking at each of these dots here is an instance and you're looking at what's the, what's the uh, variability, the variation of your confidence and what's uh, the average confidence. So here you have the average confidence over the epochs and here you have the variability. And this shows you then mapped, mapping, these two give you a, a plot in the, the X and Y coordinate in the plot. And then you measure, okay, while model training, how often was this instance correct or incorrect? Here is incorrect or correct. And then we get, okay, here are the instances which the model never got right during training, they're blue. Um, and they, the model was very un, not confident but also didn't show much variability. So the model didn't know what to do with this instance. Okay? Well, here are the instances which are very high confidence and the model is very stable. It doesn't change its mind during training. And here you have all the other instances, right? They vary during the training. And so they labeled them with ambiguous instances in this chunk, easy to learn in this upper right, upper left corner and hard to learn in this lower right corner. So it's a nice uh, visualization of getting insights of your data set. Yeah, and now um, what, what uh, Swabna and co-authors did, they used this and uh, try to um, essentially m now m not only map them data sets to this space to, to show the, how much of ambiguous cases are in there, but what they also didn't did, and this is I think interesting, is they used this for evaluation. So if they then, here's a model that's trained, this is SNLI, so again, this natural language inference data set. If you um, train the data on all of the data and test it on in distribution and the same kind of training uh, and evaluation data, then you can do um, very similar as if you just train on a third of the data but sampled from this ambiguous space. So you can train a model which is almost equally performing but um, trained on a third of the data, less data. Okay. And the curious thing here was that it's actually even was slightly better on if you shift the distribution, if you test this model out of distribution. So there is a lot of, you know, training on less data, but the right kind of data can actually be helpful to build a good model. So that was kind of the, one of the key um, things to take away from this. Okay. All right. Um, sorry. <laughs> Um, overall, uh, I want to show you then, okay, is this, this is connected to human liberation because there are also instances which are, uh, where the model doesn't know how to do well. Um, but overall, I wanted to uh, show you that human liberation is not typically something, typically it is considered bad, but I think it's not something bad. And it pro provides us also opportunities to build more trustworthy models in future, okay? Um, and this is where I go next. So how can we exploit uh, this, this for building more trustworthy models? And in the next part, I will quickly go into three use cases. All right, good. Okay. Do I take questions during or in the end? Actually, I, I will stop here and ask if there's any questions so far. Mm. Um, Yes, that's a good question. The question is, is it good or bad that large language models have variation in the answer? Uh, that's, it depends on the question you're asking, right? If you want to model various, you know, if you think in terms of modeling various opinions or values, then yeah, it's good that they have, right? If you want to have them robust, like different variations due to small linguistic changes, which should preserve the semantic meaning, then if the model output changes, then it's not a good thing, right? So um, 
Overall, though, I think the, it's very important that there is variation and it's modeled, but understanding it when which is triggered is the, is the interesting part then. Yeah, good question. Okay, yes. So I will come back to trustworthiness in the, in the end as well. Um, but in this context, um, we need to essentially trust in order to build more trustworthy models, we need to embrace also the human, human label part essentially more. Uh, that's one of the parts of trustworthiness where we need to put the human central in all of the design choices. I will get back to this in the last part of, of my, my talk. Um, but you will see that trustworthiness has many different angles, but connecting it to human is, is one of the important things so that we also gain more trust into the model that we are building. And the human users that use the models get more trust into the, into the models that we are building. But let's move to the next step because this is now one of the things where um, we are doing something which is not so trustworthy, actually. Let me show you something um, where we advocate to, um, this is a quite provocative title. This is a paper that we published last year at MNOP together with um, Joris. Joris Bahn uh, is a PhD student, uh, an Alice PhD student, co-supervised with Raquel Fernandez and Will Karazis. And here we are going to look at calibration. I will introduce this in a second and also show you uh, why it is some, something important to look at. Now, I talked about NLI and these pairs of sentences, right, that have three labels. Here is an example. So we have an example here. The first sentence is a man running a marathon talks to his friend. And the second one is there is a man running. And now the, the task is you have entailment, neutral and contradiction. And you, you ask what, what is the label. And here we have a data set. This is called Chaos NLI. Um, it has 100 judgments by humans. And you see that this is an example where there was all 100 agree on the entailment um, label. There was a man running, right. Um, but here are other low agreement cases where, for instance, the sentence was the important thing to realize is that it's way past time to move it. And the hypothesis is it cannot be moved now or ever. And you now see that people are really interpreting this differently, right? It cannot be moved now or never. It's important, it's, it's way past time and how to, how to judge this relation between the, the two. We here have um, human labor variation. And here's another example, just to show you that these are cases where it's even really uh, split across the different labels. All right, um, I hope this NLI is now clear for everyone what the task is, um, because now we are asking ourselves, okay, we know that um, these models output also um, a probability, right? And we can, uh, a confident, and we can use this as a way um, to assess whether, or we use it as a way to assess whether um, a model knows when it doesn't know. And calibration is a framework to essentially evaluate this question. So when my confidence is low, I hopefully don't know what to do. That's the idea. When the confidence is high, I, I hopefully as a model, I'm very confident on what I'm doing. And um, uh, calibration is a way to, to measure it and try to improve if the model is kind of off from this desiderata. Um, one way to, to judge it is to use reliability diagrams. So what we now have is uh, we have taken the model confidence and we bucket it um, and measure for each bucket. So it, here is very high confidence and here is low confidence. And we would hope in, in, in overall that the model would be very correct, highly accurate when it's very um, highly confident and the opposite here, right? So you would like a model ideally to be on the diagonal so that it's the, the, the confidence is well adjusted with the accuracy and expectation. And ECE or expected calibration error is one measure to quantify this. And now here we see that the model is underconfident in the high uh, confident cases and overconfident here, for instance. So the ECE score is uh, 14. So it's kind of the, the uh, average difference between to the diagonal. So it's quite, quite high expected uh, calibration error. 
Um, but what does this mean uh, in terms of human labor variation, right? That, that's the question we ask here. Um, because we are measuring accuracy. And accuracy assumes that there is, again, one ground truth. Okay? And so um, we examine calibration under the lens of human labor variation. And now this plot that you see is essentially a Roberto model that you train to do this tree la labeling task. And um, there is very different ways to use um, to make the model, to calibrate the model. In the paper, there are several, but let's focus on one that's temperature scaling. That's a post hoc method where you essentially try to learn a parameter to adjust the probabilities or the, the confidences afterwards. And so if you have, for instance, this distribution, just to illustrate it, you're trying to you know, um, rebalance it by doing this post hoc correction. Um, so that's temperature. That's the idea of temperature scaling. Now, temperature scaling can help uh, improve expected calibration error. Now, if you do temperature scaling from our previous model, we see that it gets better, right? It's get better calibrated because this one is lowered and these ones get higher and also the ECE score gets down. So the error gets down. All good so far. But what does this mean? We see that if we now analyze it, um, the accuracy stays the same between the temperature scaled model and the normal model. Um, accuracy is perfect because we always pick the right label. Uh, EC goes down, but even the Oracle is still miscalibrated because there are other cases, right, where it's more highly confident. So we know now we are only looking at one of the instances. And so this is bad. We, even the oracles miscalibrated because we are just looking at one item. And that's why we, we here propose what we call human calibration error, um, where essentially we, the idea is that we, uh, we, we measure the predictions against human var labor variation, against human judgments. So if we have access to the variation, we can actually measure how far the model is, not just by looking at one ground true instance, but the whole variation given by humans. What does this give us? It gives us a much finer grained notion of, of, of um, uncertainty in the model. And so now the question is you need to measure that, measures the difference between the distribution, the model distribution and the human distribution. How to do that? And have, in the paper we have several, but one way is simply take the total variation distance between the two and then measure that. So what does this give us? Now we can get an instance level uh, analysis, which is much more fine grained. Okay. What does this mean? Let me, let me explain to you again. So we are uh, doing temperature scaling. We are trying to reduce ECE. But what does this mean? Well, if we had human labor variation data, so data with multiple judgment, then we can measure, for instance, how closely aligned the model is with the, with the human distribution. And one way, this CE, the total variation distance, is just measuring this divergence. Okay? What you now get is you can um, put how far the, the two distributions are, meaning here they are equivalent, the human and the model is the same, and here they are very far apart. And we, we can look at how often this occurs. And what do we see now is that um, the model, this was, this correspond to these two models. We see that the original model uh, gave us uh, uh, this, this distribution. So it was um, quite a bit aligned with the human distribution, but then this long tail. If we now do temperature scaling, we, we actually reduce a lot of these miscalibrated instances, right? That's good news because we went down, okay? We could reduce it, but at the same time, and this is what we gain from this. We get insights that actually for uh, quite a few of the instances which were perfectly calibrated, we actually got worse. So uh, EC, if you just look at this bucket, the global average, it's not giving us nuanced insights into what happens with the calibration of the model. So you can get more fine-grained nuanced information because actually it's, it's also hurting uh, quite a bit. Okay. All right, take home message is uh, we showed that calibration to this human ground truth is not a good thing to do because we might make the best fit predictions actually worse. 
Um, we suggest to look at calibration in light of human labor variation. Um, we have several measures in the paper. I just showed you this idea here with this one measure. Um, the key is that we get instance level insights. Um, it's a more nuanced way to look at modeling uncertainty because you connect it to human uncertainty. But there is a limitation, right? We need data. We need multiple annotations in order to, to do this judgment. Um, and that's a clear limitation of this, uh, this direction. Um, good news is that we are collecting data sets. So there is a data repository out of, on our website where we try to collect data sets that do contain multiple judgments. And please, if you know anything, please help us uh, enrich this data set so that in future we can look more, um, more in depth in more data sets. I should also add for those of you, how many of you are NLP people? I know the, here, how many others are doing a little bit of NLP? Yeah, great, so, okay. Um, in 100 judgments for NLP data sets is quite something, I would say, right? We, we have maybe five annotators, so it's very few data sets that have such a rich source of information. So if you know anything of other fields, also from vision, let me know, I'm interested to hearing. All right, um, good, then let me move to the next part. We talked about now calibration. Uh, and human labor variation, but what this assumes is that this is genuine variation, right? It's plausible variation. Um, but we know that uh, not everything is a genuine um, uh, variation because, in fact, we know that existing, even existing data sets contain annotation errors. Um, some are very well known, um, some are less known. Um, but if you look at, for instance, say, let me give you examples. So here's a sentiment um, review data set for IMDB and you see here it's really unfortunate that so well produced turns out to be such a disappointment and this was the original label, right? So I think this is clearly a mistake or also here um, the film was and still kind of is very bold and daring. I enjoyed it and was very impressed by the filming and story of it but it's negative. Nev negative. Okay. So there is, um, or another data set is the uh, well-known Connell 2003 data set, which does named entity recognition. And um, also there, there are errors in the original annotations. For instance, uh, here you see that the person was uh, wrongly uh, tagged here as well, and so on. And um, what to do about it? That's the question. So. There is um, a line of work that is called annotation error detection, or AD, and uh, it's, it's a long-standing task which dates back to pre-neural pre NLP, essentially, and, um, but was recently uh, comprehensively survey surveyed again by Klai, Weber, and Kurovich. And um, it's, it's, it's more like a, it's an interesting area where there hasn't been so much work and we, with my postdoc, tried to contribute here. When we looked at this, um, typical error detection methods are post hoc methods, okay? And so we were wondering actually whether we can combine it in a more interactive fashion. We, we can improve it by doing a human in the loop or an interactive study. And so this is Leon Weber, a postdoc in my lab, and we were wondering whether we can improve uh, error detection by combining um, the data maps that you have seen before, the data set cartography, with an iterative procedure, uh, human in the loop. So um, what we studied in this paper was, uh, or what we proposed is called active AED, active annotational detection. And what we do is, instead of doing, given a data set and an AED model, detecting all the errors and correcting them, that's the post hoc method, do it all in one go. We iterate and do it in, in, in samples where we used as a, a, a method to select the top K detected errors, we used ideas from the data cartography that we actually looked at the divergence over epochs of training. And, um, in this way, we could see that we can improve um, active uh, error detection by doing 
both the cartography type of ensembling and the active loop. So we tested this on eight data sets and we saw that compared to other existing data sets, including data set uh, cartography, which is this one, we could get better rates at error detection over um, IMDB, so sentiment, these are sentiment tasks, uh, NER tasks, and some other classification tasks here. Where also it was interesting that it was the combination of the data map and the active learning part which helped the most because we also tried to uh, do it without the active part just in one go. What do you get out of this? Of this now, just ha what happened in this for, to this original uh, annotations? We could then spot and get back the correct annotations. For instance, here now, after doing this, we could correct these annotations errors in the data. Okay. So to conclude, um, active ED. Uh, it, and a human in the loop improves automatic error detection. And it's an in, I think it's an interesting direction to go more on the data, data, data centric NLP angle, I would say. Okay. Yeah, are you with me still? All right, then uh, we go to the next part and um, move to a little bit something else. So now, so far I, I talked a lot about classification problems, right? We had labels concrete outcomes, but now we have a lot of natural language generation and we were wondering how can we evaluate NLG um, in respect to human uncertainty or human label variation in, uh, from an NLP point of view. So this is a joint work with uh, Mario, um, uh, Joris and Wilker and Raquel from Amsterdam. And um, the idea is, um, you know, if, typically in, if, if you have a situational context, um, a dialogue, for instance, and you have here, for instance, can you help me, please? Sure, if I can, I want to send a small parcel to Canada. In any given situation, you have some communicative intent, and depending on that, you typically have a range of ways to react, right? When we talk as humans. And the number and uh, variety of plausible communication intents is really depending also on, on the task you're trying to do. So the, the, the way humans produce then answers is also depending on, on what's the, the intent that is being um, communicated. Um, so here is, for instance, a dialogue act, um, but we might also have translation, right? That's another example of a generation task where we have our instance input sentence in English and we get our transla translations here in German. And even if this context and intent is kind of fixed, right, compared to the dialogue, um, we have one input sentence, we might observe a lot of variation on the output side, right? There's very different ways in how in this data sets human translators translate the sentence. So you see, for instance, several companies were translated into viele Firmen, einige Firmen, mehrere Unternehmen, uh, so you see this variation even if you don't speak German, or similarly reacted cautiously was also um, translated by humans in different ways. And um, both of these sources of variability, the, the intent and the, how it's then realized, the form that you get, is something that is applying to both us individuals when we, when we answer, right, or when we react, but also to populations as such. And in this paper, we were interested in, okay, um, there is all this variability. How can we um, uh, look at it? How can we uh, look at it? Because it's also connected to uncertainty, uncertainty of humans and uncertainty of models. Okay, so we propose a framework for probing for uncertainty. Um, because the main question that we were driving, what was driving us is, uh, again, we want to compare the machine output to the human generations um, in order to quantify how, how divergent these are. Similar to before, right? We looked at label variation, classical labels, but now we move to generation. And um, because why do we want to do that? Because given a certain intent or task, it really depends on what's the variation that we, we even as humans expect to observe. And so if then we build a system, the premise is a good system 
would be a good model for human production if it captures this human production as well. So given this premise, the task was then, okay, given an LLM, let's try to uh, formalize, given a context, uh, what is the possible realizations that we get? And the, um, we know because we have language models, they output probability distributions over sequences. So these are intuitively also a representation of the uncertainty of the model, um, given the context. And if this representation of uncertainty, which is then used to decode, right, is a good uh, representation of this variability that we observe in human, that's the question. Is this actually a good a good representation of the uncertainty that we also observe in humans. And so um, capturing how close these are, the model distribution to human population, or even the human population distribution is something very tricky. Why? Because we don't have access to, especially on the human side, right? We are trying to, we only have samples from both sides. And, um, but we can get samples and once we have samples, we can try to uh, compare these samples. That's the idea. And so what we need for this, we need sampling and we, from modeling, and we need multi-reference data sets again to compare to. And we need a way to compare to this. And so in this, in this paper, we, we propose uh, actually quite simple ways to compare these distributions. And, uh, but we need essentially a metric and what goes into this metric to do so. And we call them production probes. Uh, once we have them, let me show you on the next slide what we, how we do it, but once we have them, we can then use them to quantify how much, you know, case the function that I use to, to uh, assess how similar things are and the Y's are now in this case two human uh, inputs. Or we can also compare two model inputs or model generations, human generations, or we can compare the, the two with each other. Okay. So the idea is, okay, we want to compare how, how similar are humans to how similar are models by looking at essentially pairwise samples that we can get from these distributions and why, given a context. So here is an example. We have this dialogue. Um, the baby has fallen asleep, then turn the alarm plays, but what, where is the switch? And then you have possible continuations given by humans, multiple, and possible continuations given by dialogue chat GDP, for instance. And now you, what we do is we want to quantify how diverse these are, human, human, or model, model, in order to get insights how aligned they are. Okay, that's the idea. And what we do in this model, we take one distance function uh, but compare pairwise similarities, and they are very simple probes. So what are, this, uh, what, what are they based on? Lexical similarity, post-engram similarity, or syntactic similarity, and semantic similarity. So think of this as some way to compute how similar sentences are from different angles. And uh, once we have that, we can then quantify how much variation we see in the realizations. And so we see now that, uh, for instance, we did this for four tasks, simplification, translation, story generation, and open-ended dialogue. And now you see that uh, if you just look at the human production that's plotted here, you see that some tasks are more, um, so um, more, uh, show more or less variability. So for instance, on simplification, you see less variability, right? It's a quite constrained task. You want to simplify one, um, one sentence to another, while for um, more open tasks, we see more variability in terms, for instance, of semantic or syntactic variability, okay? But you see clearly that different tasks or different kind of conditioning factors have different variability expectations, also in humans, okay? Now the question is how aligned are our models to these uh, variations? And so we, we measure how, how far the human distribution is from the model distribution. And if they would be very, if they would be identical, the distance would be zero, okay? And um, by doing this, we can measure this now over the three production probes. We have three lenses on how to look at the data over four tasks, and then compare how the human generated and the system generated output compares. And if they would be aligned, they would be at, at zero. 
and otherwise they are either over uh, um, certain or under certain or overestimating. So what we've seen here is um, for MT, we saw a lot of the time it's below zero, meaning that um, there is less variation in the models than in the human translations. Okay, so actually underestimating this variability that we observe in human variation. And for other tasks, we see more uh, variability. So on the um, dialog task, the model was actually much more set in simple terms, chatty than the human was. So m more diverse than the, than the human outputs were. And just to show you some examples of this, um, here is an example. Um, several companies have thus far reached cautiously when it came to hiring. So translating this um, was uh, the models were uh, much more less, um, uh, uh, much, um, um, uh, let me actually, sorry. Uh, uh, they were underestimation, underestimating the translation variability. And why that? Because we saw that humans, this was exactly this example that I uh, showed you before, the humans gave very different realizations and the machine translation model in this case in all 10 generations was always using the same uh, realization. It was underestimation and underestimating human variability. While in open-ended dialogue, the model was overestimating the, uh, the, the, the variability. So while, for instance, humans reply to very short affirmative responses, okay, well, go on, sure, yes, yeah, sure. Um, the generated responses were very lengthy and long. So, you know, perhaps a bit annoying if you would use this in a, in a system, okay? Um, all right, so the take home message here is variability is an intrinsic property of human language. And we, we propose, or we advocate that text generation should explicit, exhibit also plausible levels of variability. And uh, we proposed these production probes to compare text generators against human productions. Um, we find that there are tasks where they overestimate it, uh, like in this open-ended task, but also underestimated in more constrained tasks like MT. Uh, but this is just the first study. Just take it with a um, um, grain of salt. Um, the key is that we for, will propose to evaluate text generators by using multiple samples or when possible, multiple references to compare to. So we get, we get a better insight on how much, again, now this is trustworthiness. If we know when these models would be well aligned with what we would expect as humans, then they would be also more trustworthy um, and more closer to, 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 yeah, more trustworthy simply said, okay? Um, so just as a roadmap, let me wrap up what these case studies are. Um, I showed you now, starting from human level variation, that it's important to look at calibration also in light of this variation. Then um, there is this open question on what is actually an error versus genuine variation. That's another aspect. And then there is um, the third part, which I showed you was on this production variability by humans and we compared it to machines and that there is uh, much more to be done in this area. Okay. And with this, I think I'm good on time. I will just very briefly go to the last part, which is about uh, finally trustworthiness, trustworthiness again. Um, this is an open, uh, this is an opinion piece uh, that we, that comes up at ENIP and it's joint work with Robert, Max, Rob and Leon from the lab. And uh, we were thinking at this issue of trustworthiness um, by looking a little bit back also at or how the field developed. And um, it's very interesting to think of trustworthiness now in the era of LLMs, why? Because we have seen this paradigm shift. And what does this mean? Um, in NLP, we had really clear research designs and setups where um, I, I take this picture from David Schlangen, where we typically were interested in a very specific task that then we realized with a data set at hand, and we then were building a model for solving this task, say machine translation, right? And then you had another task like um, 
uh, dialogue, for instance, or simplification, let's take simplification, we had, an, we had a very clear defined protocol of what um, the machine was supposed to solve. That is the key, right? Um, and with this came also um, um, dedicated splits, for instance, of how the data set was then used and uh, split up to do experimentation. So uh, we call this the kind of compartmentalized view on LLP, right? It's kind of like nice compartments, compartments that summarize, or you, you can work nicely in this task scheme, right? Um, but what happened now? Now we have LLMs and this kind of traditional notion or compartmentalized notion of, so these, these, this whole thing were kind of, were called tasks, essentially. A task realized by a data set and then a model that's optimized for this task. But this compartment and notion is kind of breaking down. What does it mean? Because now we have an LLM, we have a user, and we, we, are, we are just expecting the system to solve all sorts of tasks, right? We don't say often even what the task is that we want to solve. So we are, we are, this was a nice compartmentalized view, but we're moving now to this continuum of having models that want to solve, or we want to solve, or the user wants to solve multiple things. And um, so we, we, we moved away from a task as defined as, um, let's see it a little bit more abstract. There is some expectation, like some tasks you want to solve, that you then express in, some input output pairs or whatever you, how you define it. And you then had data sets which clearly um, uh, represented were instances of this task with clear defined boundaries and we know which data was where. It was all uh, very yeah, overseeable. Um, but now with LLMs, what we get is we want an LLM and we want to solve it all of this together. It's all getting into one big pot. Well, this is great. It is very powerful. It also gives us um, um, some issues. And uh, the issue is that now we, we advocate that it's really important that uh, we think of trust in all of the ways, like when we do modeling, but also when we do um, um, build these systems. And so we take this definition of trustworthiness for David Hayes from 79, who defined it as trust arises from knowledge of region as well as knowledge of functional capacity. And from this definition, we derived four desiderata. And uh, the desiderata are that we would like to have knowledge about the model input. So, you know, when you ask the model, what do you expect from the model? Knowing this could help us do better. We'll come back to this. Um, but also better understanding of model behavior, how it uh, behaves on certain uh, ways, so getting more insights on that. At the same time, um, better knowledge of evaluation protocols to understand what we are really measuring, especially in terms of large language models, so that we can be sure that the user can gain trust in these models. And um, finally, also important, uh, the, the knowledge of the data origin. What is in these models? Where does it come from? Um, so that we can also you know, it's, it's knowledge of, of, of origin, and in our case, data origin is an important aspect. So um, let me just briefly go into two of these, the Sedirata. So we moved away from early times where we had our user who did feature engineering and designed the features that went into the system to a time where we let the neural network do it, right? It does the representation learning and um, we no longer need to care so much about the features that go into the system. We get very powerful representations that we can analyze if we have access to the weights, I should say. Um, and then we move to this huge tr using large language models. And when we do now use these large language models, we use those typically do have uh, use instructions, give instructions and prompt them with different um, you know, give them examples, but also some sort of small instructions that they are then feeding into the model. So there's the input on the one side and the output can be, can be correct, it can be truthful, up to date, but it can also hallucinate, can be biased or outdated. And um, 
Um, but if we then, on the other hand, we also know that when we pre-train these models, um, there's a large interest now in finding out what do they actually capture. And again, there's good things that they capture, like factual knowledge, world knowledge, um, but also some, some parts which are has not so good the biases then that, uh, that are coming in. But we, what are these internal and external, external knowledge? What is it? What are these ingredients that essentially, the question is from going from input to output, what happens during in the model itself? And also, what are the skills that the model is using in order to solve the task? And so if we get more knowledge, that's it rather than it's also to gain more knowledge of what these skills are that you need to solve a certain task, because there might be some skills that are um, wishful to have, like linguistic or logical reasoning skills, but there might be other skills like memorization that you might want to have sometimes, sometimes not, or there are like shortcuts that you might not want to have in your model. So understanding these skills um, is kind of um, this desiderata. And um, overall, um, then we hope that if we think in terms of these desiderata from uh, model input behavior, I'm skipping over relation data origin, then we hopefully move to, um, to more insightful model models that help us to gain trust in the future. And so what can we do about it? Uh, I leave the paper for you also to read, but in general, we, we were thinking a direction. We don't have a solution. Right? There is a lot of work in diverse angles and diverse directions. But hopefully we can just bring all together because explaining what skills are required to solve a certain task, if we get more metadata of what, what we want to do, right, could be helpful. Um, what skills the model needs to employ, uh, understanding that. Um, but also um, doing better relations is an important key and also being very explicit about where the data comes from that these, these models have been trained on, which helps us to, to hopefully understand this figure in future much, much better. And with this, um, I'm going to um, conclude. So I hope I showed you that today, you know, it was all about variability in different angles from human to machines. And I hope in future that we are much more embracing this uh, variation in the long run. And um, if you're interested in trustworthiness or uncertainty, model uncertainty. I want to just highlight that we have a workshop at ESL. The deadline is upcoming. So on the 18th of December, please consider submitting. And with this, I thank my, especially my team and collaborators because with, without them, this would not have been possible. Um, I'm also looking for people to, um, uh, to PhDs and postdocs for next year, if you're interested. And with this, I conclude. I'm looking very much forward to your questions now. Yeah, that's that's great. That's a great question. So, so um, exactly. So the skills required one one kind of direction, which which is like this um, NLI. Um, there was like these annotations where you need you needed to know which linguistic skills you need to solve this task. That's an example of what are kind of skills required for solving a task. But a very very concrete, right, example. Well, skills required, uh, skills required are these, and skills used are then, what, what does this correspond to in the model, understanding in, in the model side what this means? This is an example, but then scaling this up to all sorts of other tasks where it's really hard to come up with what is really needed from the skill side. That's the question, how to do it, how to formalize it. Yeah, but in general, thinking of, can we get more insight on that, on that spectrum? more meta information about what we really want the models to do instead of just the input output pairs essentially. Does this make sense? Does it... This is a great question. This is a great question because it opens up another angle on how to prioritize what to teach, right? To, to fill this gap because I completely agree. There's a lot, a big gap between um, just using the model without 
thinking of these parts, uh, thinking about this desiderata even, right? What, what does it mean the way I'm giving the input? How do I structure input or how, what the model is trained on, the data, right? All this, these parts. Um, because if we, if we understand more about what this model, uh, about these boxes, any box, then we are more confident in using these models, right? As a, in, as a general population. Um, so what is important? This is tricky to answer out of the box without, uh, we need to think about it. Um, I think this is easy to convince people about the data. So maybe this is, should be included in any case. Um, but the, uh, how we evaluate what we get back is, in, is a key to, 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 um, um, to, to, to give uh, to people. To, to teach as well, because what does the way we evaluate even mean? What do we evaluate? How do we, how what do what we always need to compare it to something, right? We cannot just take it out of the, um, uh, yeah, I have no clear <laughs> answer, but I, it, I really like this. Um, maybe we can just think of it as origin and capacity in abstract terms, what these models are capable of and trying to, convey to the public and to anyone what are limitations in the same sense, those capacities. Yeah, and where does it come from? Yeah, so the, in this way, we hopefully get more, more trust, right? This is thinking of them, these dimensions. Yeah. Uh, in general, um, if there is a large amount of data and there is some noise in the data, then the noise matters less than if you have a small data set with noise. Now I'm talking about errors here as noise, but then you have the variation that's genuine. And um, uh, what, what we see, so we tried recently, this is not here, but we, we tried recently just to look at the variation and try to estimate the model and seeing how, how stable this model is in terms of fitting this distribution, like this Gaussian mixture model that you saw. And we can see that in that data set where we had over 1,000 instances and 100 annotations, we can do quite well already with 25 annotations instead of 100. So if, even if you want to collect now multi-label multi annotations, there is a kind of diminishing return but it depends then on the task. This was a, this three-way label task, but these are really interesting questions, right? How much, how much labelings um, do you need for getting a good estimate, um, which then relates also to difficulty of the data, because for some instances you might not need so much because it's very clear, and so for others you need more, which kind of relates to weak supervision, right? In some cases you perhaps want multiple models to label versus others one label is enough. So these are interesting questions where there's still a lot to be done, I think, even in this classification scheme. Yeah. That's a great question. So the question is currently, uh, with open source mo LLMs, at least we are a little bit having D2 if the model weights are, are available. Completely agree, right? If we have model weights, which is, which is really, really valuable and we need more, I'm calling out now. I, I'm, I'm live streamed, right? So I can call out to the world. Please release more model weights. Um, it's true that we have, we have mostly two at the moment, right? If you think at the but the, those models, I, I completely agree, because we don't really know what the data was that, for some models like Bloom we knew still, but, but now it's not anymore. Um, but it would really, really help us to understand trust if we had all four. Um, you, you, you hinted at an interesting idea to why studying variation of the models themselves, so to at least gather some insights, even if you don't have access to the weights. Indeed, that's a, I think that's a very interesting direction. And we, we see already some, like how prompt, robust are different prompts. So works in this direction are kind of going there. I think we also need this even if we stay in a world when, where the model remains this black box as it is now. Um, but hopefully we get more insight and more access to 
um, different models that are more accessible. But at the same time, even we as, as task designers and prompt designers, we can think of additional knowledge that can help us in then not just modeling, but also evaluating these models, right? Exactly, exactly. So now, even if you think of these instruction tuning data sets, they are putting a lot of data sets in there. And some of them tease still the, the original task apart. Some don't care. They just take all of it. I think we're losing a lot by just aggregating too much. And, um, and similarly, yeah, we need to really, really dive deeper into evaluation protocols um, to understand what goes, where the, where, where the model is reacting, like overestimating the variability or underestimating variability. Or are we really modeling? You know, there's also all this interesting work on detecting values. Um, is this really the language model that we're measuring there? Or what do we measure? It's, a, it's another big question. I'm curious to see how the field moves next. I, I would completely disagree um, because there is a lot of evidence from, I, I showed you a few examples. I could have given you many, many more in the beginning, right, of, of uh, like these ones here, right? These are, these are not the best examples that you can find of because if we, if, if we, if we think at even, even very traditional NLP tasks, we can see obs observed disagreement and variation and even there, we. If we would take this literal, that whenever we, we, we observe variation, the model, the task is too hard to solve, right? That's kind of the argument. We shouldn't model it. Then we would be, um, I mean, on this task, like the, on this task of understanding indirect answers, so answers that don't say yes or no directly to a polar question, that seems like a very easy task, right? But even there, human annotation get, get a raw agreement around 60 to 70 percent it's quite low actually right so would you then say this is not not something good to do i don't think so there's even in computer vision a lot of work in this um, labeling of objects where there's a lot of disagreements in that space or other um, um, what, what is important to keep in mind is that there is this line between variation which is genuine and errors and to, to understand that line is t tricky, right? Where something is clearly an error versus there is still some variation. Because um, on the other side, on the flip side, even if we have, say, just one label for, say, an NLI task, like two people said um, contradiction, there is work now showing that despite the same label, they had very different argumentation lines of why there was a contradiction. So this is work by Marie de Catherine de Forneff and de Marneff and her PhD student. So they looked at explanations in NLI data. And this gives us again a sense, even then, you know, there's two different reasonings and we assume with this label that it's actually the same. Literally, it's, it is the same, but we are not modeling that people have different, different ways to reach to that conclusion, right, in broad terms. So I think we have a very interesting uh, object of study if we think at this variation, um, more kind of the process of how we derive that conclusion instead of just now we look at the product, at the, at the final end product, but not so much on how we got there, maybe in broad terms, yeah. Oh, the, the first here, yes. Yes, so the question was, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, I advocate for getting more trust, right, in these models um, uh, or um, yeah, exactly to, to promote ways studying these models that we, we as users get, can be more trust, uh, tr they can get more trust in these models. Um, but at the same time, if we study this, it might be used to 
essentially make them mistrust or you know the, the flip side essentially right you're asking um, uh, to influence potentially uh, right yes there is there's often this dual use right of systems uh, that can happen um, so but even now we, they can be used without much understanding what's going on to 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 um, to um, amplify certain things, right? So I don't know. I think in uncovering, being aware of this, also the limitations of your own work. But um, I, I'm a bit, yeah. Uh, it's uh, there is a lot of benefits if we know more. But yeah, of course, we cannot prevent that sometimes someone then exploits this for some not foreseen um, use, essentially. Yeah. Think first here and then there. Yes. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So the question is, could we actually solve um, variation by a more fine-grained scheme, right? Where we say, okay, falling. In. There is, you could, if if that's your goal, yes. And there is, a, um, actually, I don't, I didn't put it into here. I don't think I have it now open. No, I, I don't find it right now. But there is a nice paper by Paul Rotkor and uh, colleagues and they put it like this you have when you when you do data annotation when you collect these labels you can think a priori of what's your goal and your goal could be descriptive or prescriptive meaning um, descriptive that you allow for variation or prescriptive that you really want to uh, reduce variation and depending on that goal you could think of okay if you do a study then you might think of okay i'm actually um, uh, prescribing a much more fine-grained label set to reduce this variability if this is what you're after. But on the other hand, there is also, so th this is a framework that you can think of, prescriptive versus descriptive um, data collection. On the other hand, uh, there is also um, like very traditional work in NLP that goes back to creating tree banks, which are syntactic connotations or part of speech tagging, where there are papers where we can only go to a certain level. We will never, and there are hundreds of pages of rules or you know, annotation guidelines, they are called, where you write down all of these fine-grained distinctions and give the annotators, okay, in this case, you, do, you should do this and that. Um, but there's also cases if, I want to make this point, and you can do that, but in, especially in language, you will often still see variation, even if you try to tease it down into very fine-grained categories. And then overall, it's a matter of what you need for your task. But it's, it's good to think of it, right? Instead of, okay, I'm doing this, and then I want to go to the modeling. <laughs> yeah, because it has consequences. I hope I convinced you today that this has consequences then when you use the data and evaluate your models. Yeah, no, this is a, and that's an interesting question. Um, so the question is, um, while doing the reinforcement learning with humans, in, in the calibration of the models went down. Yeah. That was observed. And why, why this happens? Um, no, this is, a, this is a good, I cannot say why, but in a way, what would be interesting to study, who are the humans that we are doing this reinforcement learning again with, right? We don't know much about them. That's one. Um, are we just getting to, but then calibration measured in the traditional sense, right? Again, not against the human distribution. So, yeah, this would need, I, I, it, it's an interesting question that why is this happening? I, 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 would, I would really want to see this in, as we did it, if you had multiple judges and, you know, looking back at, um, the distributions, because they will judge, will, yeah, no, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I think that the way we are doing it right now is too, too little nuanced, essentially, because we are collecting this pairwise judges, convert them a number, and that's what we are trying to, 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 to um, um, 
further uh, improve these models on, right? I think it has to do with this <laughs> variability, but we need to we need the data to look, to study that. It's a very it's a great question, yeah. And the questions that were asked is another part, right? What were the, the four judgment questions? They were probably very carefully designed to, to be unambiguous. So I would, I would think, yeah. But no, good question. I have no answer for this. If anyone wants to add something or has some thought, please uh, also. Um, so, so now at this stage where we are currently, so the question is about this collection of data sets. Uh, currently, there is, uh, there is not a standard out there yet. Um, if you look at what exists, a lot of people have uh, at least collected five labels per annotations, between three to five to ten, but more than that, there is very little. Also, the size of the data sets varies considerably, there's a few thousand uh, or ma more. Um, also, the way um, what is encoded differs, whether we see, you see here, three to five, five, that's kind of a, of, often used, but whether that's a good number, that goes back to the question we had right before to study this, how much we need essentially. Um, I would advocate at this moment, let's collect all there is because often what happens is people do have this data somewhere, but they don't uh, release it, right? They, they just release the final data set. And then we don't have access even to small amounts of double or multiple annotated data, which could be useful to study. And, um, um, but understanding what we need, or even, even in this other paper where with, um, in the end with this generation data set, it was very, very difficult to come up with data sets that include multiple machine translation, multiple simplification, multiple uh, continuations of a prompt. It was very, very difficult. There's very few around only. So I think, please uh, think of, yeah, I think if we get more of those sorts of data, it can be very helpful for understanding these models better. All right. I think uh, with this note, I will close. We are in a very, very interesting moment and I hope that maybe one, once, one last time I want to show you the slide that we went really from modeling, um, a lot of spending of time on modeling, to now is really a good moment to go more into the thinking of data evaluation because this is really central to trustworthiness and we hope, we hope to get more trustworthy systems in the future. And with that I end here. Thanks a lot for your questions.